My name is Kasper Skorgård Petersen. I am the head of publications here at the Institute. And for those of you who might be new to us, we are a independent, non-profit futures think tank. For the last 50 years or so, we've worked across the uh, spectrum of future studies and foresight in order to guide individuals and organizations and help them act on the future today. Once again, a warm welcome to this future seminar, and we'll be right back with Pela T. The American law professor Christopher Stone published a seminal book titled Should Trees Have Standing? In the book, the professor toyed with what he called the unthinkable idea that our legal systems, if we wanted them to, are perfectly capable of integrating landscapes and living things as legal subjects. What was then an unthinkable idea has since increasingly become reality with the emergence of an international rights of nature movement, which seeks to award natural features such as landscapes and ecosystems with rights on par with those given to us humans. In a way, it's an attempt to fundamentally restructure how we relate to the ecosystems that we depend on, using the law as a tool to do so. To help us get a sense of what this rights of nature is all about, we are now joined by Pella Thiel, uh, who is a knowledge expert with the UN Harmony um, with Nature Initiative. She's also a co-founder of the Swedish Transition Network and Ecoside Sweden and Save the Rainforest Sweden. So welcome Pella and thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. Great to be with you. So rights of nature is probably an alien concept to most people. So I think we should start with, with the basics here. What does it mean for nature to have rights? Actually, I, I would say that it's not so alien. I mean, um, most people understand that nature has the right to life, to exist and to thrive. What's alien is that in a culture that we are in, the Western culture, we have this idea that nature is something outside of us, something that's there as a, as a tool or as a property of humans, as objects that we can use. So it's not alien to us as individuals, but in our culture, it's, it's very alien. And um, so shifting that idea that nature is an object for human use is uh, the idea that nature actually has the right to life and uh, that it consists of subjects with interests that could be um, acknowledged in law, having legal rights. And so um, on the list of countries where this uh, rights of nature movement has found some successes in the legal system, we find countries like Ecuador, Bolivia, Brazil, India, New Zealand, and Colombia. And all of them have something in common, and that is that they are all countries with a large indigenous population. Is this a coincidence or is there a reason for uh, this correlation? Yeah, definitely not a coincidence. Um, the, I mean, indigenous cultures all over the world, they, they have another idea of human existence in harmony with nature, that humans are actually part of a living whole and that we have to respect and uh, live together in a healthy way with this whole. So uh, indigenous cultures have been informing and inspiring the movement for rights of nature and, and the legal institutions to include that idea. Mm. And could you maybe give us a sense of what does a charter of rights of nature look like? How would it read and what kinds of rights would be in there? Yeah, definitely. So uh, one of the first and, and still one of, of the larger uh, incorporations of rights of nature is uh, Ecuador who still is the first country that has rights of nature in its constitution. And that has been kind of a language that a lot of other legal uh, instruments has built on. And it reads in the Ecuadorian constitution that nature or Pachamama 
where life is reproduced and exists, has the right to exist, persist, maintain and regenerate its vital cycles, functions and processes in evolution. So that's kind of the basic right to existence and to, to thrive and, and to evolve. And uh, it's obviously very different in um, different legal contexts. As you said, this is a movement that's now, I think it's almost 200 different legal decisions in uh, many, many countries now around the world. So it's different in, in different uh, context but but um it's often about like either you could do like in ecuador where the whole of nature is acknowledged as right bearing or you could have that some specific um, ecosystems like open rivers are deemed as legal persons so then it becomes the river is really healthy to flow not be polluted and so forth mm. and it did this movement get started in Ecuador? Or what What do you see as sort of the, 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 the starting point of, of the rights of nature movement? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, you mentioned Christopher Stone, and that's definitely a big seed that he planted back in 72. And then it became a discussion around the uh, turn of the millennium, where there was a, a, a Catholic priest, Thomas Berry, who had written about that we need a, a different view on nature and that uh, nature can have rights as humans have rights. So that was also uh, a very important um, formulation of that idea. And then uh, several environmental and social movements began starting to, to talk about. So we know that there are a lot of challenges globally to nature. But if we would envision on an alternative that we could strive for, what would that look like? And uh, that's kind of where this discussion started. And then a huge step was, was also taken in Bolivia in 2010, where a draft declaration for the rights of Mother Earth uh, was presented. Hmm. And um, would you say that rights of nature is a goal in itself, so awarding rights to nature as a goal in itself, or is the better way to think about it as, as a tool, as a means to an end, which could be preventing uh, pollution or over-exploitation of resources, for instance? Which is the better way to think of it, uh, do you think? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, I, I think it differs in how you think about it. I think about it as a, as a tool. Uh, but not maybe to avoid pollution, but actually a more a, uh, a tool to do something bigger and something more radical. And that is to rethink the story that we are telling ourselves in, in the Western culture. So to me, it's it's a bridge. It offers a way out of this anthropocentric misunderstanding that that we have and, and that's so deeply seated in uh, in the society that i live in and uh, shifting uh, shifting the paradigm to um f from this view of nature as something outside of the human realm something other and uh, to a paradigm where we are part of nature of the living whole and where pollution or over exploitation of resources would be something that was inherently very very bad um, so, um, so if someone were to come to you, Pella, and say, well, that's, that's all nice, but if we give rights to forests and uh, IKEA can't chop down the trees to build the furniture we all need, we will all be poorer for it. What would be your response to that kind of statement? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that's sweet with the rights of nature, but you know, we have a reality here where we have to we have to keep doing development, right? Uh, actually, I think, so this is kind of what I, I view of nature as an idea that makes us rethink what we mean with development and which is really necessary to do right now. Because what you said now is kind of a false dichotomy. 
which stems from this fundamentally misguided understanding of separation between humans and nature, which is also the story from science now that, you know, <laughs> we are totally dependent upon the living systems of this planet. So when IKEA or other corporations, for example, chop down forests or um, take all the fish in the sea or fill it with plastic in a destructive way, then we're all over it. And uh, what's happening now is not that we kind of, um, that this is something that is starting now. It's been ongoing for decades, like from 72 or longer. But what's happening now is that we are collectively waking up to this and start to think, how can we do things differently? Because I think it's really about, I mean, to me, this is a lot about human dignity. Uh, we are humans, so we have this wonderful capacity to be creative, to understand, to be conscious and to choose how we do things. And uh, for this shift to happen, I mean, because we can, we can, I'm, I'm very sure that we can fulfill our needs in a way that is healthy and beautiful for the living whole, not just for us. And uh, for this to happen, we desperately need better share ideas about why we are here and what development is. And uh, this, that means that this is really about, this is not an environmental issue at all. This is actually, you know, at the core of who we are as human beings. So we are in an existential shift here and it's really encouraging to me to see that this is not just you know philosophical concepts or nice ideas but it's actually something that is now happening uh, all over the world right. and and i wanted to add if you can add uh, because i think it's so yeah, uh, uh, you said that you will have this discussion afterwards on uh, how we can also work with the economy as a tool because mm. so as i said this is about working with law as a tool for a human existence which is uh, more in harmony with nature and i have been really suspicious about using uh, the economy as a tool as um, that is kind of a step further in the direction of instrumentalizing nature it, um, handling it, understanding as a resource for humans. But I have actually started to rethink that recently because if you have rights of nature as, as the, the basis, as the ground from where you can start thinking about, so how do we safeguard nature? How do we um, uh, live together? with with forests with lakes with rivers um if you have rights of nature as the ba basis then you can use the economy as a tool like for me for example i can sell my work someone can value what i do for them but that just becomes sane when i have the fundamental right to to be who i am to have life uh, but if i don't have that and and I start to uh, you start to value the job I'm doing, then I become your slave. Mm. And that's how we, we treat nature now. So actually um, acknowledging that there are legal rights in the in the as a as a fundamental, then you can start working with the economy as a tool. So it really frees up that um, uh, understanding in a in a very exciting way, I think. With that, I want to thank you for joining us, Pilla. That was a good connect to the next uh, part of this seminar. So thank you so much for, for tuning in and sharing your, your, knowledge, your knowledge and insights with us. Thank you so much. I look forward to, to listen further. Thank you. And I should mention, I was told there were some sound issues in the beginning. The book that Pilla was talking about that I referred to in the beginning was uh, by Christopher Stone and it's called Should Trees Have Standing and that's sort of where this idea of uh, rights of nature got going so just to make sure we don't have any blind spots here that's the name of the book if anyone wants to check it out.
Okay, we'll be right back with part two of the seminar, and I'm joined in a minute by my colleague Martin Korte. So stay tuned. Are you clear? Okay, um, I'm now joined by my good colleague Martin Krose. Uh, I should mention also, I think it was lost in the intro, we're talking about this today. It's the second edition of our quarterly print publication. It's called Farsight. This issue is called Futures for the Living World. We'll be sharing a QR code so you can all go get it in our online shop after the talk. But now to, to you, Martin. Um, you are a senior futurist here at the Institute, and you are our resident expert, I guess we could say, on environmental and resource-related issues. You recently co-authored a major survey together with Epinion, uh, examining the, how well the values and actions of Danish consumers correlate when it comes to sustainability. Mm -hmm. So, first of all, welcome to you, Martin. Thank you. Uh, and to all you watching, um, if there's anything you would like to ask Martin after our little talk here, um, we will round off the seminar with a Q&A. So put all your questions in the YouTube chat window and we'll... Um, We'll pick out uh, some of the best ones towards the end. So, um, Martin, we just heard Pella express this idea that we need some kind of reorientation in the way we think about and relate to the living world, uh, broadly speaking. And uh, in the interview you, you give to this edition of, of Farsight, you express a similar idea, but slightly different in some ways, in that you believe our dependence on ecosystems or living systems at large, that includes agriculture, for instance, um, this dependence is not priced into our economies and our ways of measuring values. And this, you believe, makes society vulnerable on a systemic level. Can you explain what you mean by this? Yeah, well, well what I mean is that when you, when you look, at, this is really an age-old problem, uh, a problem where uh, what's called negative externality is not priced into the system. So what does that mean? It, well, it means that, uh, let's say that I, you, we're um, emitting CO2 here in Denmark. That CO2 will be, um, will create acidification in the oceans and that will uh, help destroy the corals. So uh, corals, they are a nursery for, for fish. And there is approximately a uh, one billion billion and 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 a half that are that are dependent on that protein source. Mm. So the thing is here that even though we are emitting CO two, we are not paying mm. for the fact that there are people out there who will not get their protein source. Mm. So this is this is a um, a systemic problem because while we are. Uh, are acting in a certain manner. There are no, there are few regulatory uh, prescriptions for us that will uh, contain our actions, so to speak. Mm. Um, and this is this is a problem that is has to do with the natural world. It has to do with the way with we engage with climate change. Mm. So uh, a couple of years ago, there were 27 Nobel Prize laureates uh, in in economy that. Uh, signed a statement saying that we needed to price carbon. Mm. Because of this, because of this um, uh, flaw in the system. Mm. And I think uh, there's a lot of people that might say that, well, this is, you know, this is capitalism gone astray or neoliberalist is uh, capitalism. But, but within a capitalistic system, it's, it is basically uh, the boundaries are set by the rules of law, mm. right? So, um, so it's basically a market failure mm. and one that needs to be corrected. And the thing is that 
if we could correct those market failures, we, we get an economy that is more, you could say, fluently or it's more in tune with, with what is actually going on. Mm. And if we don't have that, we have a system which is uh, less resilient. Mm. And um, so, so this is, this is a problem that is being worked on. Mm. And so uh, I have to ask, what did you bring today? You have a little stone here on the table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I brought this because, well, we talk about the natural world. Mm. And I, I found this. I don't know if you can see it. It's an ammonite. Um, and it has to do with, um, well, this, this, this actually probably died in the last mass extinction some uh, 700 million years ago. They died um, the same, approximately the same time as the dinosaurs. Mm. I found this in the Himalayas, some 3,000 meters up. In a, in a mountain somewhere? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so it's actually older than the mountain itself. Right, I see. Um, but what is really cool about this is that it has jet propul propulsion. So it moves. It has jet propulsion. Yeah. It moves as a, well, it has a jet to move. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, uh, and I think what we tend to, what, what we tend to forget is that there's a, a, a natural world which we may consider have little importance to us, but there is a huge amount of innovations mm. to be learned from, mm. from nature because mm. they have, I mean, this, what, this fellow might be 100 million years old and it invented jet propulsion, you know, so, so, no, millions of years before mm. we were ever, mm. ever at, mm. on the planet. This guy invented it, yeah, this little guy. 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 <laughs> and so now we're Don't facing a, a new mass extinction, uh, which is, is human, human cost. Mm. And I guess the idea here is that we might be missing out on, on a lot of potential innovation found in nature through extermination of uh, well, the thing is natural that species. Fundamentally, we will probably need to change society as we know it. Mm. And that means innovation. And a lot of those innovations, a lot of those solutions can be found in nature. So, so let's not destroy uh, this, uh, this, uh, this gold. Mm. So, so if we turn our attention from uh, biodiversity to, to the climate question, um, you talk about thresholds mm. uh, beyond which stuff happens that we have no control over and we don't mm -hmm. know what's going to happen. Yeah. I, I, is it the same, you know, climate scientists also talk about thresholds, that if this happens, then mm. we don't know, basically. Um, creates unpredictable snowball effects, we don't know where it will lead. Is that this, mm. are, are those two, so are the risks the same, so to speak, when we talk about loss of biodiversity and, and climate uh, thresholds? Uh, well, many of the uh, mechanisms that we put into play are the same, and uh, the system itself is. I think we. I think one of the the, the, the issues here is that we have this uh, reductionistic approach to nature, and we need to move towards a understanding of nature which is uh, complex, and where we think more holistically. Um, and that is, that is an approach that, that we are taking. And when we do that, we see that systems are interrelated. So you cannot say that uh, Siberian, um, the permafrost in Siberia, that is, it is something distinct from climate change because yeah. it is, it is uh, related to climate change in the way that you know, when that decomposes, what happens is that the methane is emitted and it has an effect on the planet. So, so if you talk about the Siberian permafrost or you talk about the Brazilian rainforest, those systems interconnect mm. with one another and mm. they interconnect with, uh, with the climate. So mm. it's, it's, not, it's not something we should separate. Right. It's not either or. Um, so um, you recently co-authored a report, a, a survey, um, together with Ipin Jung, mm -hmm. examining how well sort of the lifestyle habits of Danes and their values match when it comes to sustainability. And 
um, it's a big report, it has lots of findings, it's very interesting, I think. Uh, what would you say is the biggest takeaway from, from the survey? Uh, one of the biggest takeaways is that um, the link between our values and our behavior is rather weak. Mm. And I think we, we, we tend to think, and it's, uh, we tend to think that there's this psychological consistency within us, and there's a need for that. But what we see here in this report is that, at least for two of the segments, um, there's a discrepancy between what they believe and how they act. And how many segments did you end up uh, identifying? There's, there's four segments. You can see there, there's those that are psychologically consistent in the sense that they're their uh, beliefs and their actions are the same. Mm. Uh, and those are those segments where uh, you act to uh, mitigate climate change. Mm. And of course you act according your, to your beliefs. Mm. Or you do not act. And uh, that is also according to your mm. beliefs. The thing is we have two other segments. So rather interesting because one of the segments is a segment where you you understand that climate change is, uh, is happening. Something needs to be done. Mm. But you don't really want to do anything about it. Mm. Uh, and I think you and I fall into that category. Mm. Uh, at least uh, speaking for myself, I sometimes take a plane up and jump out of it, and I do that five times a day of skydive. <laughs> so, 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 you know. Skydiving is not a sustainable hobby. <laughs> it's not. It, I shouldn't do that. And so, but it's a good point. You know, anyone who flies a few times a year, chances are your, your personal carbon footprint is way higher than what it needs to be, you know? It will be way higher. And the thing yeah. is, you might stop eating meat, mm. or you might, you know, uh, take a bike sometimes, mm. but if you just fly a couple of times a year, that pretty much doesn't matter mm. because it'll just offset the whole thing. Mm. So, uh, so there's this, and I think you and I will will, will have a, will be hard pressed mm. to say let's let's not fly. Mm. Uh, and and this is basically the what we see in the survey, and I think basically the problem for for people here is that. What are we supposed to do when, when, we, um, when we are basically asked to stop flying, to stop, from, in my case, stop, uh, stop parachuting, right? Mm. And we don't really want to do that. Mm. But there's, there's, just, uh, there's another uh, fourth segment, I think, which is really interesting, mm. um, which is the ones that don't believe in climate change, mm. but they actually are doing more to mitigate, mitigate climate change than you and I are. Right. Uh, and, that's and, and, and how is that? How is that possible? Well, that's because the entire, uh, if you mitigate climate change or not, it's not related to your attitude. Mm. It's related to your income. Mm. So uh, the people that are, um, that are doing something, even though they don't believe in climate change, they will typically be uh, retired. Right. Uh, you know, plus plus 70 years old. Mm. They don't have a lot of money. They don't fly a lot. They don't buy a lot of clothes. And so you, you might even see in a situation which is, you know, funny, you can almost think of this Greta Thunberg um, young person that buys a lot of clothes every month, flies somewhat, sitting next to her grandfather and saying, well, you destroyed the whole thing. Mm. But she will actually have a higher footprint than her granddad. But let's stay with this uh, footprint idea for a while because we know the term carbon footprint is a term that was popularized partly via the PR efforts of the oil industry. Specifically, British Petroleum in the 2000s had a large uh, media campaign. Some mm. would call it a propaganda campaign. <laughs> um, where they, they, um, they push this idea. Hmm. Shouldn't we be suspicious of efforts to move the responsibility of lowering carbon emissions onto the consumers and leaving it there? No, I think it's the exact right thing to do. Because the thing is that companies are, are here to earn money providing goods 
and responding to a demand. And um, if they provide goods in which there is no demand for, they will die. You know, they will go bankrupt. So basically, there is this consumer or there is this a citizen that can either demand goods from the companies or they can demand change from the politicians. But it's not the politicians nor the companies in itself, by themselves, mm. that can do this. They are responding. That's why we have a representative democracy. Right? It is us. As Gandhi said, if you want to change, have change, do it, start by yourself. Mm. And we, we need to take the responsibility back to us. Because if we change, I can assure you both the politicians and the consumers will change. Oh, sorry, the, the corporates. Mm. And <coughs> as it is right now, corporates are doing a lot. You know, politicians to some extent as well. What we need is consumers. Mm. We need citizens. Right. And so um, the survey is, is a survey of the attitudes and behaviors of Danes. I think it's interesting because Denmark is often highlighted as a front runner when it comes to sustainability. Uh, you know, we have a big renewable en energy sector. We bike to work, many mm. of us. Um, we sort our trash and so on. Yet the average carbon footprint of a Dane is, you know, many times higher, around 11 tons of CO2 per year, depending on how you measure it. In any case, many times higher than where we need to be in order to reach the goals set in the, the Paris climate um, agreement. Hmm. So safe to say, if you look at the Danish population the isolation, we're pretty far off the mark of where hmm. we need to be, um, where we need to be. So uh, what will it take to actually get us there? Uh, well, we need to change our behavior, right? Um, and that's, I think, what this survey shows is that that's going to be very, very difficult. So it's going to be politicians together with technology and together with this changing behavior that will push us in the right direction. So it's not going to be either or. It's going to be a gradual, gradual thing. Um, the problem with that is, of course, that if we are demanded to, to change the way that we do things, uh, just think about uh, what it takes for you to uh, stop drinking milk and drinking something which is a, an alternative. Mm. Uh, we don't generally like that because it's, you know, we're used to a certain products, mm. we're used to eating meat and, and drinking milk and so forth. So that's going to take a long time. And the thing is, we don't have a lot of time. So it's, the, the problem is really here about the speed of change mm. that we need relatively to the um, how, how slow that people actually generally move when they have to change habits. Mm. It sounds a little bleak to me. <laughs> is there anything that gives you a cause for optimism? Yeah, well, there is. Um, I mean, there's a... If you look at uh, um, corporations now, they, uh, they are voluntarily disclosing, uh, but also they're pushed by the EU to, uh, to disclose the risk uh, financial sector is 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 asking for corporates to to disclose the risk that they have in terms of uh, first of all climate change, but that is being discussed to move towards the natural system. Mm. So, I mean, uh, this this entire discussion is is on the table and it's it's moving forward. Uh, so, we, I think we've seen more changes in the last ten years than. Um, not that I would have hoped, I would have hoped more changes, but we'll, we have a scenario, I think, which is, which is really nice. The problem is, we started some 20 years behind. Mm. So, uh, so, you know, a lot of things are happening, but relatively to what should happen, mm. it's too slow. Right. Um. On that note, I think it's time to move on from some, to some audience questions. Uh, we have an opening question here from Karl Heinz. Hello, Karl Heinz, who asks, I am currently reading a book which is set in the near future where an extreme heat wave hits India, killing 
20 million people, after which a group of eco-terrorists start targeting individuals, politicians and industry leaders who they believe are responsible for curbing the green transition. Okay, so pretty, pretty extreme stuff. Uh, so the question for you, Martin, is, is eco-terrorism something you think we might see more of in the future as the climate crisis intensifies? Um, I mean, we've seen uh, terrorists um, act on all kinds of uh, ideas, issues, beliefs. Uh, why not to save the planet? Mm -hmm. So I guess that um, would be reasonable to expect. So not an un unlikely outcome. We have another question here from uh, D, just D, who asks, uh, circular economy has been a buzzword for a decade now, yet it's still based on the ideology of limitless growth. And the question is, do we need to abandon circular solutions or can a circular model be adjusted? Is it, is it feasible, I guess? Uh, good question. <clears throat> I think um, uh, there are huge issues with a circular economy. Uh, because it's very hard in the existing system to uh, design products in such a way that they can be taken apart uh, and reused and transported around uh, in a closed system mm. in such a way that it actually has a net uh, benefit. Mm. So the problem is that it sounds, the circularity sounds very good, mm. and as a concept, it is very good. But when we start taking it apart, oftentimes we find that, at least with the existing system, mm. that uh, we, tend, we tend to, uh, to use more CO2 in the, ex in the system mm. than we actually mitigate. Mm. So, uh, so the, uh, not to say that this is not the future, but I think it's also very important to look into the technologies that we have mm. coming because it is possible to take a step back and let's say burn trash, synthesize the gases and pull out materials. Mm. And as long as you start talking about burning uh, waste, people will start go, oh, I thought that was what we you know, that's where we came from. Mm, mm. So, so, you, so people will have a hard time thinking that that is actually positive. Mm, mm. But, um, but, and that's why I keep get, getting back to this uh, systemic approach. We, we need to make sure that, that what we do has a net positive effect. Mm. And sometimes it means doing stuff that might seem like the wrong thing to do. Mm. And I think it's very important, it's actually very important in terms of the political dialogue because politicians have a tendency to sell that which consumers can understand. And so we get non-science-based policy, non-science-based policy making. Mm. And that is a huge problem. Uh, increasingly, we, we need to, to understand that um, the systems are complex so I can give you an example. Uh, I, I, I worked uh, for the Norwegian oil company a couple of years ago, and uh, the Green Parties wanted to stop the export of oil to, uh, of, uh, sorry, of gas to, uh, to the EU. Mm. But if that had happened, uh, the EU would, would import gas from Russia. Russia right. would start their own or their old coal fire plants. And what was thought to be a good action actually had the uh, uh, a worse effect. Mm. And so this was before the Ukraine-Russia war yeah, and all the fallout. Yeah. So, the uh, so we need to understand that we are moving into a system and we need to, you know, we need to have the systemic approach. Mm. So you don't believe that consuming less, for instance, is a viable answer? It's also an answer, mm. uh, but uh, looking at the survey that we've <coughs> produced, um, and I mean, you and I, I mean, we know this. I think instinctively we know that if someone's going to tell us, don't fly, mm. 
don't jump out of airplanes or mm. go diving or whatever, we're not going to vote for those guys, right? And I mean, we don't, <laughs> right? Maybe, maybe. And, 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 and so, so we're caught. But, but that's interesting. Like, there's an element of individual choice versus being forced. Yeah, if, yeah, that's if plane point. tickets were that expensive, you know, I'd fly less, you know. Yeah. If there was a huge tax on the, the carbon emitters, mm -hmm. you would have to raise prices, I would be able to fly less, I would fly less. Yeah. So that's an interesting dynamic at play there. Yeah, I there think is. your point about, you know, if we don't vote them in, who's going mm -hmm. to force these things to happen, you know? Mm -hmm. But we actually have a, a few more uh, audience questions that I want to get through. So um, one here, let's stay on the theme of, of flying for a minute. It's from uh, Alison Quaid. Thank you for the question, Alison. Uh, she writes, given that aviation is responsible for 2 to 4 percent of CO2 emissions, even if we all stopped flying, we would still have 96 percent of CO2 emissions being emitted. Can you address the most important actions to take? I think it's important when you look at uh, the emissions from, from, uh, from airplanes, the reason why it's so low is because there are very, very few people in the world that are actually fly, flying. But the middle class is increasing, so that will increase as well. Uh, so that's one thing. And the other thing is that they're actually emitting CO2 or, or um, uh, high up in the atmosphere, mm. which has a, it actually had a, a doubling effect mm. on, on the emission. But um, so how do we address all the other issues? Well, we have change in the way we heat stuff. Mm. Uh, that is being slowly addressed. Uh, but the key issue here is that if, just let's, let's take a country like Denmark. Mm. We emit 0.1% of the world's CO2 emissions. Uh, China, a couple of years ago, their, their monthly increase was the size of the entire Danish uh, yearly emission. Monthly increase in China was the same as the yearly Danish yeah. emissions. Yeah. Okay. It, was, it was actually uh, above that. Right. So we could say, why are we supposed to do anything mm. when they're the bad guys, mm. right? Well, because we're actually the ones who have the money, mm. right? Because you look at it from a cap, cap, per capita perspective, they don't have the money to do mm. that. I mean, but we have. And we've been burning fossil yeah, fuels for been, hundreds of years. We've been creating the problem. They just right? started it 50 years ago. Yeah, and so, so when, you, when you look at you know, uh, the last cup, that was one of the issues that was raised, that governments haven't paid um, developing countries so that they could move forward in, on their trajectories and invest in, in renewables because we don't want to pay, mm. right? We, we, we have for, for years we've just said, well, this is, this is their problem mm. and ours, but it, it's also theirs. Mm. Basically, it's, it's, a, it's ours, right? Mm. So uh, here's a question from Hannah. Uh, Hannah asks, thank you, Hannah. Uh, don't you think it's the politician's responsibility to make science-based decisions, i.e. the need to reduce carbon emissions? Uh, to make it easier for the consumer to make personal decisions accordingly. That is, yeah. but, the, but I think <laughs> uh, that even if, though if we have all the information, and this is what, I, what we're talking about here, right? Mm. Even though we have all the information, mm. we still don't act. So it's not a question of, and we, we've actually asked this in the survey, you know, what's the reasons? Well, lack of time, lack of knowledge, lack of... It's all the excuses. Mm. The thing is, we're caught in a situation where we have, you, could, you can say, there's the categorical imperative from Kant, which is that you're morally obliged to do that which is good, and it's only a moral thing to do if it does not benefit you. Mm. So why should I do something with which doesn't benefit me, I should do it because it's, it's the right thing, it's the moral thing to do. Mm. And the question is here, you know, is this really a question, basically a question about values? Because as, as Peter talked about, or as you discussed, 
we have indigenous tribes, people that would probably answer this survey differently mm. because they have a community understanding mm. and understanding about their relationship to nature. So the way that we have built our system is based on, uh, you know, laws and the economy, but, but that system is, is on top of a set of values, mm. include human rights and so mm. forth. Uh, so we, of course, we can change that system. Mm. But, but at some point, we might, uh, we might have to discuss whether the values that we've had for so many years, uh, and which are probably also a part of this individualistic culture that we have, which is kind of ecocentric, if, if, we, if it's necessary for us to kind of move somewhat away from that mm. in order to balance the rights of of nature um, mm. and move towards a more sustainable uh, climate. Right. Let's do one final question uh, from the audience. This one is from um, Neil Tamhain. Thank you, Neil. Who asks, what is your take on carbon offsets? It is a pretty actively debated tool slash mechanism which hasn't really taken off in the past. Well, there's a, a good reason why it hasn't taken off because um, if you look back to the Kyoto Protocol, and this was actually one of the reasons why um, the Article 6 in the Paris Agreement was such a hurdle, is that when, when you try to, uh, and this is not very debated, but I think it's, it's hugely important, the whole concept of us being the richer nations uh, that can help uh, and leapfrog or help uh, help poor nations to leapfrog is that we can provide technologies to them. That means when we have done our part, we can actually make sure that we can we can uh, take the low-hanging fruits in developing countries. But we don't have uh, the means to completely define how they do that, and so. Time and time again, what we've seen is that um, the money that we've sent has been uh, has been used for um, yeah in a corrupt regime. So basically, we've done more harm than good, and that has been a huge problem because then the entire notion that the richer world is supposed to help the poor world has kind of been, um, yeah, uh, that ha hasn't really worked mm, very well. Right. Should we take one last question? Hmm? All right. Um, let's see here. Um, here's one from uh, uh, Joe Swan Su. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, who asks, uh, on the topic of aviation and following Neil's question, Neil's question from before, regarding carbon offsets. Many airlines encourage customers to pay an additional small amount of fee to offset carbon. What are your thoughts on this? Well, uh, we actually asked about this in the survey, and there is less than 1% that are doing it. So, so uh, consumers buying airplane tickets, yeah. less than 1%. Check consumers the little box. Are, uh, buying airplane tickets and then checking uh, the box. Right, and, yes. And, yeah. and the thing is that uh, what airplanes uh, or airlines are doing is they're buying trees and investing in biofuels and so forth. So, they, so they're, they're taking these monies and turning it in a, I would say, in a proper direction. And of course, they are very uh, mindful that they are not doing greenwashing. Mm. So, but the real thing is here, how much are you paying? You're paying maybe less than a dollar for a a carbon emission to a certain um, destination that should probably cost fifty dollars. Mm. So what the airlines are, are doing is say there is, there's no way you're going to pay, mm. pay fifty bucks. Mm. So we will take a little bit. We'll give you the you know the satisfaction of doing good, even mm. though you're not mm. not really because you're not really owning up to the mm. responsibility of the price of the actual carbon. But that's one thing. But they're also investing in areas like you know, Africa and, and other places where you can actually get 
a lot of um, trees or whatever you invest in at a cost which is uh, far lower than let's say the hundred US dollars that you would that you would usually uh, pay if you were to um, um, be in line with the IPCC's uh, demands. Mm. All right, with that, it's time to wrap up. Thank you, Martin. Thank you to the audience for all your questions. Um, also, thank you for, to Pella Thiel for tuning in and sharing uh, your thoughts and insights. Thank you to the audience again. Brilliant questions. It was amazing uh, to have so many uh, engaged uh, viewers here with us today. So if you thought the discussions we had were interesting, we hope that you'll consider Go into our online shop, picking up your copy of Futures for the Living World. We'll put a QR code on the final slide. Uh, we also have a link to our membership if you want to make sure never to miss an edition in the future. And finally, if you'd like to read the report that Martin uh, has been talking about on, on Danes and the Climate, we have a QR code for that as well. Again, thank you everyone for tuning in and I hope to see you next time. Thank you.